fee rather simply put this is the fee paid by the telecom company making the call to the telecom company receiving the call now in telecom language it's called the interconnection usage charge or IUC in 2015 the IUC was reduced from 20 paise per call to 14 paise and last week it was cut further to 6 paise with the TRAI committing to eliminate it altogether by 2020 this has now become the newest controversy in the telecom industry and here's why the new player in town Reliance Geo has argued in favor of zero IUC Incumbents such as Vodafone, Idea and Bharti Airtel are crying foul. Since Jio is a new operator, more calls are made from Jio phones to their networks than vice versa. One brokerage, that's Edelweiss, estimated that Jio will now save about 26 rupees per subscriber. That adds up to a total 4,200 crore rupee gain for Jio, according to Edelweiss, whereas Airtel will lose about 1,320 crores and Idea will lose about 820 crores. And when the IUC goes down to zero, those losses could very well double. Most analysts have forecast two outcomes of this change in IUC. One, that competitive intensity will increase as Geo may use these gains to offer bigger discounts, adding to the peer pressure in the industry. And two, that the stress on the sector will deepen. Why then did TRAI do this? To answer that question, I'm joined by Arya Sharma, the chairman of the regulator. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharma, for joining us here on Bloomberg Quint. You want to explain to us why this has become so controversial, and despite the many representations that many incumbent telecom companies made to you, sir, about not wanting a lower IUC, you decided to go ahead and do so. Uh, let me first explain to you, as you yourself said, what is IUC, right? Interconnect your charge, as you yourself just now said, is actually a charge which telecom company B pays uh, to handle telecom company, uh, you know, A's, uh, A's call, so to say. Now, this is uh, agreed and accepted that this particular charge should be based on cost. You know, how much is the cost which, how much is the work which <coughs> the company which is handling the call does to, to take care of, uh, of the call. So the, essentially, the, we try floated a consultation paper uh, in August of 2016, and we went through a process of about you know, 13 months, and we heard uh, all these stakeholders, every telecom service provider and uh, uh, other, other stakeholders, that is the customers, etc. We had three, uh, you know, we had uh, open house discussions, and we finally had a workshop also where every telecom service provider presented their arguments. And then TRAI, uh, based on all these inputs, uh, went ahead and, and computed the actual cost which is incurred in handling the call. And it came to a, a figure of 5.9 paisa. And it rounded it off to 6 paisa. And then we issued the, uh, the uh, regulation on 19th of this month. And as you will see, there are, uh, you know, the uh, regulation has an explanatory memorandum, which actually uh, is pretty, pretty explanatory in the sense uh, that it contains 32 pages of, of explanation, which answers to that question as to why uh, the TRAI took the review and other questions. And then it has the cost models and data sheets uh, uh, for, for computing this. And the, there are absolutely no assumptions in that. So essentially, TRAI is duty bound uh, to compute the cost and then, you know, uh, fix that interconnect user charges. Uh, Mr. Sharma, so it's I, not as if you know why that. did TRAI no, go ahead no, the with No, no. The reason, uh, sir, the reason I asked you that question was because yeah. I wanted for you to elucidate to our audience the one or two compelling reasons that you decided to go in favor of six paise. Now you've explained to us that the cost, according to your modeling, worked out to five paise or five point nine paise, and hence you decided six. Uh, from all the arguments I've read in both the consultation paper and the explanation memorandum accompanying your order of last week, I understand that one key reason for implementing a zero IUC regime is to encourage telecom companies or service providers to move towards newer age networks, IP networks, because in those networks the cost is zero uh, for terminating calls. But does this argument not ignore the tremendous capital investment that existing telecom companies have already made in their existing networks? Does this argument not inadvertently favor, in some form or the other, a new player who might be entering just in the last few years and therefore have the advantage of a new network? 
No, not at all. This argument does not uh, ignore the fact uh, that the existing telecom players are uh, have made investments. It certainly does not. It essentially reimburses the cost of handling their the calls. So, in what way? I don't understand. If 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 uh, the the payment to the new or the old is being done on the basis of actual uh, work done by them, why why should that uh, be be uh, uh, an issue? Because now, the, the issue as to whom it favors, whom it does not favor, is not, not the one which, which we are concerned with, so to say. We are concerned with computing the cost, and we have done so. And have the calculations of your cost taken into account the cost of investment of building out these networks? Can you explain to us whether the historic costs or the investments that there the incumbent is, players have put there, in no. has been accounted for if in you, that 6 no, paise cost, you, sir? No, certainly. What has happened is that the explanatory memorandum, if you see, it basically, you know, in clear details, it explains as to why the, the historical costs and, and what kind of costs are to be included and what kind of costs are not to be included. So, so essentially, that part you will find that in the model which we have used, the common costs are not included, not to be included. And, and that's, the, that, that's the way it has, it has gone. So, therefore, uh, to say that uh, you have not included the uh, common cost, there are uh, absolute reasons for that, adequate reasons for that, and which is explained in the memorandum. Uh, okay, I'm going to raise to you the many objections that incumbent players have raised to us as to why they don't agree with the zero IUC regime, and it would be very illuminating to hear your response or your explanation of this. One of the other things that they've said is that if TRAI wants us to move to a new network, and this is one way of doing that, then maybe they're ignoring the fact that, you know, the cost of termination actually depends on the smartphone that consumers use, and that the penetration of Volte-based smartphones is less than 10% in this country. So the point that they're trying to make is that the way these costs have been arrived at, the way you look at the usage of phones themselves, all of these don't necessarily add up to TREI's position. Unfortunately, you know, I must say that there are established methodologies, right? And we have used, we have not invented a methodology. Lyric is a, is a standard methodology used all over the world, and we have used that methodology. What we have done is we have you know, plugged in that methodology, the cost sheets and the data provided by telecom service providers. So nothing has been ignored, nothing has been added to a standard methodology which is, which is available. Mr. Sharma, the other, the other question being raised about the zero IUC regime is the traffic asymmetry that currently is ex being experienced in this industry. Uh, Geo obviously makes more calls than it receives from the incumbent players. And it's not just the incumbent players that have raised this. Several research companies and brokerages have also raised this. So let me quote to you from Kotak Institutional Equities. They wrote a report that says, it is no secret that there is massive traffic asymmetry between Reliance Geo and the incumbent at this point, Reliance Geo is running a massive interconnect bill, whereas the interconnect EBITDA for inc incumbents has gone up sharply since Geo's launch. Uh, so the suggestion also is that money is being taken or EBITDA is being taken from the incumbents and passed on to Reliance Geo. I think, uh, uh, Menka, you are, you, are uh, you know, sort of connecting a number of issues which are not really you know, germane to the basic question of computing the IUC, right? As I explained to you that IUC is computed on the basis of a particular methodology and the cost sheets and everything is, is, is there. Now, obviously, it will benefit somebody, it will harm somebody. That's not really the issue here, right? So, essentially, the, the methodology you should go into, you should question that. And secondly, the traffic asymmetry issue, let me put it this way. If you are being compensated for the cost of doing something, then if the number of calls on your network are more or less, how does it make a difference? Because if, if, the, if the cost is coming to you, if you, if the, if you handle one minute, you will be paid six paisa. If you handle 100 minutes, you will be paid 600 paisa. In what way does it harm you? It would have harmed you if you were being paid less. It would have profited you if you were being paid more. So this is this is exactly what you are what you are spending and that's what you are getting. But
but Mr. Sharma, you know better than I do, based on all the representations made to you by the incumbent players, that their argument is that the costs are a lot more than six paise. So whether it is the technical calculation of costs done by TRAI or their basis of working out the costs, they suggest that the interconnect cost on their end is somewhere between, and depending on who you talk to, 25 to 40 paise. They said we were opposed to the IUC being reduced from 20 paise to 15 paise. So, I mean, look, this is a technical issue. I'm not necessarily the expert on what is precisely the interconnect cost for each telecom player in the country. You are. I'm asking you to explain why you all don't see eye to eye on this. No, I, I do not have to explain. I think we have provided for in the detailed cost sheets and, and, and if there is any error in those cost sheets, uh, people are absolutely, we are absolutely ready to accept those errors and we will rectify our, our orders. But as far as the, you know, the data is there, the cost sheets are there, um, somebody is saying that, no, your, your cost sheets are not good, then, you know, you, you are basically questioning the model itself. And, 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 and then, you know, you are free to uh, uh, question that, that's okay. But, but as far as we are concerned, we as a regulator have taken this call that this is the model which we have applied and we have given adequate reasons for applying that model. And this is the uh, result which that model provides, uh, model gives. No, I get that, Mr. Sharma. I'm not questioning the regulator's authority. I'm simply questioning or asking if you can explain to us why something as technical as a cost seems to have so much controversy surrounding it. So why is it that your methodology of cost is not agreeable uh, you know, with the incumbent players? Because they have gone on and on about this ever since the consult started last year. That you all don't see eye to eye on the cost. Not just that. I think some of the other arguments they've made against an IUC is that, you know, an IUC provided a floor. It thereby helped, a tariff floor, that is. It thereby helped prevent predatory pricing. Uh, because of that, it also allowed for the incumbent players to invest in rural areas where there may not be much traffic, but th those areas needed service uh, from these players. These are the many arguments that they've put to us, and I'm asking you whether these arguments held with you or not. If you remember, uh, I think Audrey had spoken to me from your uh, channel. And uh, I had requested Audrey to read the explanatory memorandum. I've read it, sir. Uh, and, and you will find answers to all these questions. And I think you should inform your, no, you should inform your viewers if, if, there is any, uh, if there is any question which is not answered, ask me those questions. Because I think all these issues as to why a particular methodology has been used and other, other related questions which you are asking, they are all there. Uh, just, now the question just, just is that somebody is not us, agreeing sir. with it or somebody is just questioning it. What can be done about no, it? No, I'm just, uh, we've heard yeah. from the incumbent players. They've appeared Say it again. on Bloom. Uh, we've heard from the incumbent players. They've appeared on Bloomberg no, they, Point. They, they've that's, stated that's, their case. I'm so therefore asking for you to explain to our viewers why they are wrong and TRAI is right, sir. No, no, I have already explained to you that, you know, methodology I have explained to you, computations I have explained to you, right? So then what else is, uh, is, is a left uh, which I have not explained? So you don't agree that this six paise cost is too little and you don't think that it might encourage predatory pricing as is the case being made out by incumbent players? Not at all, because basically six paise has been computed in the most transparent way and the computations and the data inputs for these costs are for everyone to see. So I don't see if 2 plus 2 is 4, then 2 plus 2 is 4. Whether I say it, you say it, or somebody else says it. So why, 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 why would uh, somebody say that they, they don't agree? If they don't agree, they may not agree with the methodology. That's a different question altogether. Okay. But you so, don't agree with the cost seats. That's something which I don't understand. And sir, the modeling that suggests, I know this is in the explanatory memorandum. Unfortunately, I can't read that out to viewers. Uh, so I'm asking you for a succinct explanation. You have said that it will be zero IUC by 2020. Uh, you've obviously used modeling to understand why you think the current yes. six pesce cost, according to your estimation, will go down to zero by 2020. Can you explain to us why you think that the, the best case scenario by 2020 is... Yeah, I, 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 I will try... Yes, yes, I, I will certainly try to explain to you. See, what has happened is that all the networks are now going to become IP-based networks. Already the 
already the back ends or the middle ends of all the telecom service providers network networks are IP based. We already have seen major operators in this country have committed to or have already started IP based uh, you know uh, systems uh, front ends. So therefore, what will happen in an IP based network? It's all data. Data is the new raw material. You construct voice from the data, you construct you know, uh, music from the data, you construct uh, pictures, videos, etc. from the data. Now in that world, what happens is that the cost of handling a call becomes a fraction of a paisa even. You know, for example, one megabytes of data can handle about four minutes of quality call. Therefore, what happens is, in a, in a digital and in, a, in an IP network, the voice becomes an application on top of the data, made out of data. <laughs> so that being the case, the cost becomes progressively, you know, it becomes very, very insignificant. And therefore, you know, this bill and keep uh, thing which we said, now if the bill itself becomes more or less close to zero, <laughs> then it is better to be kept rather than you know being given to other guy because because it, it's very insignificant so that is why we feel that by 2020 and we have been conservative in that january of 2020 the networks will all converge to an ip based networks which will basically reduce the voice to be merely an application on top of the data and therefore the cost of handling calls will become more or less zero and that's why we have uh, given that kind of uh, uh, timeline. Uh, sir, in your estimation at this point in time, what percentage of the incumbent telecom networks are IP-based networks? Because the remainder will have to, in the next three years, convert to IP-based, right? It'll, in my estimation, it'll, it'll do sooner than that. Nevertheless, we have, uh, if you see the regulation, we have kept that after one year of operation of this uh, uh, regime we will see the uh, we will review it we have the uh, you know we have, we have decided that we'll probably review it and, and then uh, take a call one way or the other uh, and sir the TRI so, so get... it is not as if 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 the the estimations don't come out to be true then you know we we will uh, we will be able to uh, make a mid mid course correction as they say Okay, fair enough. Uh, TRA has been able to estimate currently what percentage of the incumbent networks are IP based. I'm not talking about the new networks because the new networks are all uh, packet technology as you point out. But the incumbent networks, what percentage would be IP based, would you know? Say it again. Uh, of the incumbent networks, sir, what percentage would be I, IP I didn't based? I hear the question. No, uh, of the incumbent networks, what percentage would be IP based see, at this overall, point in time? Overall, would you know? IP, no. About about eleven percent. That's the that's the figure of December of two thousand sixteen. So as of December 2016, 11 percent of the current incumbent telecom networks were IP based and you are hopeful that about 90 percent of it will no, convert no, in the next three you can't, years. You can't sort of say somebody if, no, no, no. Every incumbent or every operator is at different stages of development, right? right. Different stages of, of IPification if you may use that word. <laughs> so, so I can't give you specific operator-wise figures, but no, what no, I'm not, saying not overall, specific, not specific operator-wise, uh, you know, sir. percentage of, of networks. Yeah, no, I was just trying to estimate and help us understand, uh, you know, Say what kind. Of, I was only trying to understand how yeah, how much you, IPification, about, as you called it, it, it is it left to about, do. It, 89%, as I said, 11% is all IP-based. I got it. One argument that the incumbent players have also been making, yeah. and you would In know fact, better. In fact, it will be it will be today. Today, if you today if you see, today if you see, it should be about 15% to 16%. Okay. All every right. operator, every major operator has committed to IP-based technologies in near future, and, and they are going to do so. 
Okay, so I, I think you've said that you expect that the 85% will be done in the next three years. And anyways, you will review the progress within a year or so to see if there is any mid-course correction required. One argument that right. the incumbent players right. have made uh, against this zero IUC regime is that they say, and I don't know if this is 100% true or not, you will help me understand this, they say that in very few countries or almost no countries in the world does the calling party pay regime and the bill and keep regime coexist. So these two regimes do not coexist in any other country in the world or in most other countries in the world. What is your experience or study of international practices been? I think you have used this, you know, this uh, zero IUC based regime. We are still not at zero, Menka. We are at six paisa. You have used this term three times. I'm talking uh, about the, three years from now, sir. Asked. Uh, that's one. And secondly, no, no, that's, that's fine. But, but I just wanted to make that point because in this zero IUC based regime is, is what you have been using uh, since last uh, uh, quite a number of times. Now, coming back to the, uh, the, the question that bill and keep and the CPP, as they say, calling party pays regime cannot coexist. Let me answer that question from not from the you know world experience, etc. Because we don't have to be guided by anybody in the world. We are a mature telecom market, one of the largest market in the world, one of the most vibrant markets in the world, and we really don't have to, uh, you know, be guided and compared uh, with others. That's one part. But uh, uh, let me do this way: be, bill and keep may be a commercial arrangements, right? Is a commercial arrangement. What we have said in the explanatory memorandum, if you have read that, is that the cost of handling a call will come down to close to zero, as I explained to you, that data is the new raw material out of which you make various products. So bill and keep has got two terms. One is bill and another is keep, right? So now if the bill itself becomes zero, close to zero, then you better keep it. Because the cost of actually realizing the bill, the logistics, the billing, etc., and finally paying the other guy's bills also is not worth it. So, so, so that is why bill and keep is not as a, as a business part in the CPP regime or otherwise, what I'm saying is that this is automatically, even if you continue with the principle of, of cost-based payments, then in an all IP networks, this, this bill itself will become close to zero. That's, that's what we are saying. All right, fair enough. So I know you're short on time. I've already taken quite a bit of it, so I'll make my last question a quick one. But unfortunately, I do have two parts to it, so I'll put both parts to it. Uh, one is that, you know, uh, there is acknowledged stress in the telecom sector. Banks are also worried. Uh, rating agencies have pointed out that, you know, the stress is only increasing. So I will read from a quote from an India ratings report that came out right after the IUC change was made to six paise, not to zero, that the credit metrics of incumbents are deteriorating on a year-on-year -year basis, thus indicating a gradual stress buildup in the sector. Net leverage has been increasing after witnessing a recovery in FY15, and interest cover has been on a downtrend. In the recent last few months, we've also seen an interministerial group speak with telecom companies to understand how this stress can be alleviated in whatever fashion that the government can alleviate it. So on the one hand, we have stress. On the other hand, we have now a potential reduction in revenue for the incumbent players. At least that is their allegation and calculation. You may not agree with that. Do the two square is my question to you. And the second part of my question is that they have suggested that they might consider going to court. This matter has gone to court once before, before the change in 2015 was made. Uh, do you expect this to become a long, litigious few years? Let me answer the first question. I think we are mixing a lot of issues here. I'm not very sure if the IUC has anything, any connection with the stress in the sector. Whether it increases the stress or decreases the stress, uh, I, I don't see any connection. Because if IUC is actually a charge, a money which is reimbursed to you as a telecom operator for handling somebody else's call, and that is based on the work done, the payment is based on the work done, then you are basically being compensated for whatever work you do. So in what way does it really increase the stress is not very clear to me. I also think, and everybody agrees, 
that IUC charges cannot be a profit vertical for any company and should not be. And therefore, reducing the IUC and reducing it just to the extent that it compensates the cost, this does not really contribute either positively or negatively to the stress of the sector. That's the answer to the first question. The All second right. question answer is that, well, in this country, everybody has a right to go to the court. Everybody has a legal right to approach the appropriate legal forum. And, and therefore, if, if the telecom service providers go, I mean, I have no uh, comments to offer on that. They have a right. And we have also have a right to defend uh, uh, the TRAI stand in the court. No, absolutely, sir. Do you, do you consider at all that if they make further representations to the TRAI, you might reconsider this six paise regime? Is there any scope for that at all? Or is this six paise regime here to stay? This, this, uh, no, no, this is, this is a hypothetical question and I don't want to answer this question. But they will make representations to you, sir. This is not hypothetical. They have done so when the consultation paper was put out. No, so they have, <laughs> this, no, this, this particular, this particular, this particular uh, regulation has been made and after a due deliberation, after a huge amount of consultation in a fully transparent manner and therefore uh, there is no question of any, you know, kind of, uh, changing, etc. that doesn't allow, uh, arise. All right, we'll leave it there. Mr. Sharma, thank you very much for your patience and your time and for explaining to me and our viewers exactly why you fixed the IUC at six paise and why you hope to go to zero paise by 2020. That's R.S. Sharma, the chairman of the TRAI. And as he said, uh, this is a, a country where everybody has a legal right to represent their case in court. So let's see what the telecom operators do next.